Hello, welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody in the room, but also welcome to everyone who's attending on this webinar. It's our first um, LES webinar that'll be simulcast, presented live, but also recorded and hopefully accessed um, later in time. Um, my name is Steve Holzen. I'm the co-chair with Ray Van Dyke for the Washington, D.C. chapter of LES. Uh, Ray sends his regards. He was unable to attend today. Uh, he has a personal conflict, um, and he was disappointed, or is disappointed, to not be here today, uh, in part because we have a great set of presenters, but also because this is our first uh, meeting in the new facility with Finnegan, and also he's worked many months on getting this webinar set up, and so he's disappointed for many reasons, and unfortunately he's not here, but I was happy to step in and MC on his behalf. Um, Again, many thanks to Finnegan for hosting. I think this will be a nice venue going forward. I personally love the venue because it welcomes you unlike the other, the other room, which we've been in for many years. Everybody seems so far away, so it seems nice. You're very close and more inviting. So I'm looking forward to a many more meeting, monthly meetings here. Um, anyways, thanks for Finnegan for hosting, for the gracious lunch, and um, uh, for those of you who are in attendance, and, and in addition to uh, John Paul for making this room available. Um, our want to make a quick announcement. We have a upcoming meeting um, on March 8th. It is a co-hosted meeting. It's at the Kenwood Golf Club. It's on a Sunday, so it's Sunday, March 8th. Um, it is going to be a confession from an ex-CNN journalist. He's going to be giving us um, his take on how to keep the political conversation temperatures down and um, the degree to which we've lost objectivity um, uh, from a political discourse standpoint. So we look forward to that. Hopefully everyone can make it. It's again in Bethesda, Sunday, March 8th. Um, as for today's presentation, uh, we're very lucky to have today uh, Dana Corelli and Jeff Henson to discuss updates from Capitol Hill. Uh, our first presenter will be uh, Dana. Dana is a DC-based attorney and a senior government affairs professional with more than two decades of experience working on legal-related technology policy and intellectual property issues. Um, he has worked in the private sector and as well as with the executive branch in the United States Congress. He is currently serving as the executive director of the Licensing Executive Society International, LESI, and he also consults on IP policy and legislative issues domestically. Most recently, he served as the director of the Office of Government Affairs as a member of the executive management team at the USPTO. After Dana speaks, we're lucky to have here today is uh, Jeff Hansen, IP counsel for Senator, Senator Hirono. I said that correctly? Yes. Jeff Hansen is counsel for the office of Senator Mays Hirono uh, in Hawaii where his portfolio includes intellectual property issues, antitrust issues, technology policy, among other issues. Prior to working on the Hill, Jeff was counsel in the Washington, D.C. office for Wilmer Hale. His practice there focused on intellectual property litigation before federal district courts and the ITC. He also has experience with um, IPRs, covered business method reviews, uh, all before the PTAP. Jeff also clerked for the Honorable Raymond Chen at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So with that, I will turn it over. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm going to stand up here uh, and, and talk a little bit and, and tell you a little bit about uh, LES and LESI, and then I'm going to move back to my other seat and, and have a conversation with Jeff on issues that you all might find interesting. Um, I don't think I need this because I have the lavalier mic. Um, so uh, first of all, happy Mardi Gras to everyone. I hope you're celebrating appropriately. I, I do have a hat. Um, I'm not going to wear it for the entire event, but uh, please enjoy it. Uh, thank you to Finnegan for providing the Mardi Gras cookies as well. Uh, for the rest of the day, you're on your own to really celebrate. So, so please uh, uh, choose your celebration uh, appropriately. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit first about uh, uh, who is LESI. Um, so I am the executive director of the Licensing Executive Society International. It's an umbrella organization for 33 societies around the world uh, with the focus of uh, serving licensing professionals, uh, creating uh, both networking opportunities but also professional opportunities to grow in their practice. Um, so companies, large and small, um, uh, law firms as well. The interesting thing 
uh, is there's a number of non-attorney uh, professionals as well that are part of LESI. So it's really a great opportunity to kind of bring people together. Uh, and that's the purpose of the organization. Um, I've, I've provided kind of some more detail here in terms of the type of local uh, networking opportunities, uh, global networking opportunities as well. Um, we uh, uh, do uh, an annual meeting that one of the societies will host this year. It's going to be in Berlin. Anyone wants to go to Berlin in May, please join me. Um, when you go on the Twitter account, um, if you look up the promos for it, you hear this uh, this um, <clears throat> this music that is uh, you know like dance music that'll get you just excited about just going. Um, the licensing comes after, but the music starts. So. Um, um, the, the rest of LESI, uh, as other professional organizations, we see a number of committees focusing on uh, different industry verticals. Uh, we host a variety of meetings, conferences, and webinars uh, to educate, uh, and again, also to, uh, to create uh, both mentoring opportunities and networking opportunities with a population that you might not uh, always interact with in, in your day job. Uh, finding colleagues in other countries that are doing the same things that you are. Um, so LESI uh, is, um, uh, was founded in 1972. Now the important thing about that, given that we're sitting in the Finnegan space, is that actually LES was founded in 1965, and it was born here out of the Finnegan law firm. Mark Finnegan, in fact, created this organization. And only a few years later, the international arm, which I work for, uh, was born. So um, I think LES and LESI, has a, because of that, a close relationship with, uh, with, with Finnegan. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the luminaries in our profession, particularly in the IP world, uh, that have participated uh, go, go much beyond that, but we got our start here. Um, and uh, as Stephen mentioned, John Paul, who's a partner here at Finnegan, uh, uh, he is not my uh, next president, but my president after that. So I'm um, glad that Finnegan continues to, to help support uh, LES. Um, uh, LES then, uh, when uh, around the time when, when Mark Finnegan helped uh, create the organization and LESI was formed, was a very different organization. Um, these are black and white pictures for those. There used to be black and white pictures uh, of, of people in an audience. This is in Scandinavia. Um, you, you notice it is very um, not just black and white, but uh, a lot of a lot of uh, white males in the uh, in, in the pictures. Today, uh, it's a much more diverse population, um, uh, and we take advantage of the fact that it's a global network uh, to provide a great entry point for young professionals that are looking for an immediate network. And we have a very strong uh, uh, young members Congress and more senior attorneys that um, have uh, had a very successful career are now at the point where uh, both their social network is within LESI, so they have a lot of uh, good, good friends, but also are giving back to the organization. Um, so on both ends of the spectrum, we have that. Uh, increasingly, it's a very diverse uh, um, uh, organization in terms of its leadership. Uh, uh, the current president is Fiona Nicholson. She's uh, uh, based in the UK. The next president is Audrey Yan. Uh, she's based in Singapore, um, uh, so we're, we're very proud of, of, of that diversity. Um, uh, uh, Fiona, uh, here uh, pictured in, in, in red, um, uh, has been throughout her term talking about taking the business of IP to the next level, uh, which gets kind of into the purpose for LES. It's advancing the business of IP globally. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of things that we can do in that field. Uh, we're uh, continuing to work with um, uh, a number of other organizations that focus just on IP, we can, we can have good partnerships there uh, where we bring experts together, actually talk about the cutting edge of, uh, of practice um, while we're also trying to connect folks. Um, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of promise in the organization uh, that's been around for a long time. This just gives a sense of the, the current board of directors uh, and the different societies that are represented on the board. Um, and I talked a little bit already about the value proposition uh, for LESI. Um, uh, LES USA Canada started with a, a certification program uh, uh, on, uh, on licensing. Uh, there's also discussions of other certification programs to, to bring the credibility of the organization to, uh, to practice uh, as you're, as you're uh, engaging with clients. A um, number of other kind of traditional things you'd see, member uh, directory, uh, 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 webinars, um, licensing royalty rate survey, which is again uh, a product of uh, the LES USA Canada. Um, uh, a shepherd of that, LESI, is helping to support that as well. Um, and then uh, a number of publications, Lady Bell, our journal, uh, Global News, um, uh, our electronic uh, newsletter. I'll get to flip through all those slides and I won't talk about them. Um, 
Um, I was going to uh, mention briefly, like I mentioned to Stephen, um, we just, I just came back from our winter planning meeting. So it was about uh, 100 of our of LES uh, leaders around the world, uh, the heads of the, the 33 societies and other folks that are active in the committees. Um, and we were in uh, Padua, Italy. Um, we actually met with the mayor of Padua here. Uh, Padua is a very interesting city, uh, which is uh, an interesting balance of a lot of history uh, and a technology development. In fact, uh, the actual institution was founded in 1222. Um, so, you know, over 800 years of history, um, as an American, it, it was not lost on me that I was sitting in a room that was twice, more than twice as old as my, uh, my country. Um, uh, it claims as, uh, as some of its alumni, uh, Nicholas Copernicus, Galileo, you know, uh, miners in, the, in their fields at the time. Uh, but then, you know, uh, more, more recently folks uh, from um, uh, Frederico Fagan, uh, inventor of, the, of one of the early microprocessors. Um, so we, uh, this is the organization, there's an organizational meeting uh, for all these leaders to try to help them think about what can LES and LESI do today. Um, so we, we try to pick a locations that help inspire that. I, I think this was a, a really interesting uh, uh, one to go in uh, and both uh, uh, heard from professors and from uh, small companies. Uh, that are trying to, to license their technology, and again, in the backdrop of uh, a place that's been doing this for so many, so many years. In fact, um, part of their uh, charter language uh, was uh, that they were the university itself, the University of Padua, uh, was uh, to uh, focus their course of study on high-level education, scientific research, and technology transfer. Um, so it was a perfect place for us to, to be. Uh, we talked quite a bit about. Um, uh, about meetings, but uh, also finding new ways to connect uh, attorneys. Um, which brings us back to the value proposition. This is not a mission statement. This is kind of the things I've been focused on, uh, but creating a global platform that enables networking, uh, education among uh, professionals, and, and do that globally. Um, there also is a, a, a very important role, both internally uh, within our members, to talk about uh, policy issues and the impact of technology development on the industry and frankly on the practice. Um, the conversation around disruptive technologies, where two technologies are coming together um, and kind of upsetting the normal ways of licensing that technology, the normal ways of getting that, that technology out to the marketplace. There isn't always a way to connect the right players. Uh, so that's a role that certainly the organization internally can play. And then externally, um, there, there's a dearth of uh, leaders out there talking about the importance of intellectual property, uh, the important role it plays in moving things into the marketplace and then being successful. Uh, there's a role here for uh, all of the societies to play very, very locally and certainly for LA side as well. Um, oh, so with that, I'll, I'll just mention meetings that are coming up. Um, when I was putting together this slide, I, I, it, it looks weird, kind of weird because the meetings are up here um, and I didn't want to center it. But the reason why I didn't want to center it is because every time it seems like, uh, oops, every time it seems like we do um, some kind of presentation. New Zealand gets lost in the shuffle because it's that far off of the map. So I felt like at least I should give one presentation where you could see New Zealand. So um, everyone, that's where New Zealand is. It's a beautiful place. Um, LASI annual conference is coming up uh, in, uh, in uh, May uh, in Berlin, uh, a great city again to, to do it. Uh, the agenda is still coming in, but I encourage you to take a look. Um, the USA Canada meeting is coming up later this year uh, as well. I, I attended the one in Phoenix uh, early, earlier uh, or end of la year last year. Um, uh, the meeting in Philly promises to be an exciting one uh, as well. So I encourage you to do that. Stephen already uh, talked a bit about uh, uh, Jeff and his background. Um, I, um, I spent the last 10 years at the US Patent and Trademark Office uh, running the, the uh, Government Affairs Office. Spent some time before that at the Intellectual Property Owners Association. I spent my, a little bit of time up on the hill and, and, and at a firm. Um, so over the last about 25 years, I've, I've had uh, great opportunities to talk about IP issues that are important to us. Um, I wanted to bring someone that could talk about what's happening now, particularly in the Senate, uh, but we'll talk about other issues as well up on the hill. Um, so I invited Jeff to, to, to come uh, join us. Now, both of us said we're going to try to connect some of these issues as much as we can uh, to uh, licensing commercialization. I, and 
as a number one point, number two point, try to connect these as much as we can to kind of the summary of what you all might uh, need to know to either inform your clients um, or help navigate some of the issues that they're facing. Um, so we're going to try to go through uh, a bunch of the issues um, at somewhat a high level and then hopefully we'll get to some questions as well. Um, so Jeff, let me start with, let me move over here. Um, Stephen gave you a, a quick introduction, uh, but tell us a little bit more about how you uh, came to Capitol Hill, why you thought that was a good opportunity, and, and why the senator from Hawaii. Sure. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm Jeff Hansen. I'm a counsel for Senator Maisie Hirono from Hawaii. Um, so going way back when, uh, probably when I was in high school, I was always interested in um, potentially working in government, particularly on Capitol Hill, it just seemed like an exciting place to be. And that kind of just stuck in the back of my head as I went through my career. Um, I was initially an electrical engineer, that's what my degree is in, um, my undergrad degree, and then I worked for, for Lockheed Martin. Uh, decided to change paths a little bit and went to law school, um, graduated in 2010 from Georgetown, um, and started working uh, at a firm at the time, Bingham McCutcheon, and then not too long afterward going to Wilmer Hale. Um, and after being there for some time, uh, interrupted by a year when I clerked for the Federal Circuit, um, that kind of bug of working on the Hill just always kind of, it kept coming, jumping out. And at one point, my wife said, you know, if you don't do it soon, you're never going to get the opportunity to do, to do so. Um, so I started reaching out to some contacts on the Hill, seeing if there might be a slot for me somewhere. And lo and behold, the, the junior senator from Hawaii has a real interest in patent law. Um, and had always had, as she considered it, a gap in her staff. She has an amazing staff, but she always had someone covering IP that that wasn't their main portfolio. And she, she wanted someone who could speak that language. Um, and it just so happened that I was looking to come to the Hill at that time, and, and they reached out. I, I had a conversation with her chief counsel at the time. We started talking about the Stronger Patents Act, which she was a, a co-sponsor of. She started asking me about 101 reform. I started talking about that, and you know, she made clear, I don't understand any of what you just said. Um, so I'm going to take, I'm going to take it at face value and, and recommend to the senator that you join the staff. So that was about 18 months ago, um, and I've really loved it ever since. Um, now, uh, the, your your boss's interest in patents and IP, I'm sure, has a couple different ways, but one is because of her committee assignments. That's right. So, so tell us about the Senate Judiciary. Sure, so she's on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, which has, uh, as part of its portfolio, intellectual property, among various other things, as you can imagine. Um, she's a member of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee that right, right now is chaired by Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina. The ranking member is Senator Chris Coons from Delaware. Um, it is probably the most active subcommittee of this, the Judiciary Committee, if not of any committee. We have. Um, Probably we've averaged more than one hearing per month, which is a lot for a subcommittee on the Hill. Um, my boss is one of the more active members. She's been very engaged on some of the patent issues we've dealt with, um, one-on-one reform, some other issues, um, some copyright issues that have come up. Um, we're doing kind of a year-long study of the, uh, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act right now in the committee, the subcommittee. Um, we've also touched on some things in the trademark space. So, you know, her interest in these things go back to her first um, kind of involvement in government back in Hawaii and then in the House of Representatives. She started to learn about the incentives that, that um, I, intellectual property protection creates and started to meeting some of the creators in Hawaii and just was really inspired by them. She doesn't have a background in IP, um, but just was fascinated by it and has really gotten engaged. Um, Jeff and I were talking, I think my first engagement with uh, Senator Rona was on uh, actually about IP uh, from the office, but talking about the small businesses in Hawaii. And uh, there's actually a thriving small business community there that, that's relying on uh, their technology. There really is. So, you know, I went back to I went back to the state in October. Uh, a real tough part of my job is, is going to Hawaii every once in a while. It's yeah. just terrible, yeah. right? Um, Rain the whole time. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. This is good. terrible. I didn't spend any time in the ocean or at the beach or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I spent a lot of my time meeting with some of these tech incubators or they have a real um, burgeoning creative community of um, musicians, um, script writers, 
um, otherwise. The Hawaii uh, economy is really focused around tourism, as you can imagine. It used to be a big agriculture, agricultural state. As land became much more expensive, there are fewer and fewer farms, the economy started focusing, some might say too much, on tourism. So if they've tried to diversify, the state, um, the university have really invested in, you know, like I said, some tech incubators. I was meeting with them a lot, and that's, that's where the state really sees the future of the economy. Um, they see themselves as something as a gateway to Asia. Um, they have a lot of Asian tourists who come there um, to Hawaii, and they're trying to entice some investment there out in the islands. Um, so that's really what they see as the future. And, and I was trying to talk to folks there about what's going on in the intellectual property space in D.C., what the impact will be on them, and why it's something that should be really important to them. Great. Um, I'll, uh, let me hit one other issue in terms of the, the background. This, is all, this all goes to the issue of politics or local. Um, so we talked about one, I think it's certainly one of the uh, uh, things that have driven your boss to have interest in this is, is, um, uh, is important constituents that are developing technology. Um, I will say, having been uh, born and grown up in Rhode Island, I also lived on an island <laughs> in Rhode Island, also prominently uh, tourist and also trying to diversify. So sure. I appreciate that. It's not quite as nice the whole time <laughs> of the, the year, but, it, but it's nice anyway. Um, but not only is the interest of the small uh, businesses and, and hopefully uh, and the innovative economy, but employees as well, yeah. right? Um, so talk a little about that, because you and I worked with that in my previous life. We did. So, you know, as you can imagine, you know, a state like Hawaii suffers a lot from a real brain drain. Um, you know, kind of the best and the brightest um, students come up through school. A lot of them come to the mainland for college and then don't necessarily have real great job choices if they were to come back to the state, so they stay on the mainland. And the state sees that as a huge problem. So they're trying to, to do what they can to entice people to come back or to keep them there to begin with. So one small thing that, that I worked on with Dana, it was one of the first things I did in the Senator's um, office, was, as I'm sure many of you know, the Patent Office has a great telework program. Most of their patent examiners work from elsewhere. And there's a program called TEEP that's kind of the full-time telework program. Well, that program did not extend to the state of Hawaii. Um, Hawaii and Alaska were exempted from full-time telework. So we actually had a few patent examiners who lived and worked in the islands and once a month would fly back, one to Arlington and one to Dallas, would work two days um, in the office, spend the weekend, work two more days in the office, and then fly back to Hawaii. They always had to touch base back in their home office. They were doing this on their own time and on their own dime. Um, which you can imagine gets pretty expensive. They spend a lot of time. Um, so, you know, I reached out to Dana, started talking about, you know, what we could do about this. Um, I know he started working on it. Um, we had an oversight hearing with Director Iancu. If it wasn't the first question, it was the second question that my boss asked of, you know, we have this problem, what are you gonna do to fix it? Um, and as, as you can imagine, when a senator asked that question right off the bat, it got fixed pretty quickly. Um, so now we have a number of patent examiners working in Hawaii. So people who want to get involved in technology have another avenue to do so. Um, and that was another thing I did when I was back in the state. I met with these, these two women who were kind of the impetus of doing this. And you can imagine they couldn't be more thankful to have this opportunity. They don't have to travel all this way. And also they've just started talking to younger people in the community about this as a career opportunity if they want to stay in the island. Uh, I don't know, I, I forget if I've told Jeff this story, but um, you know, there's lots of reasons why the, the <coughs> technology reasons why the PTO is slow to do this, but you know, it was, it was time and, and Jeff and I started talking. Um, at least, I hope I'm not known for this outside the PTO, but at least one of the things I'm known for at the PTO is I brought food trucks to Alexandria uh, for all the examiners. And I, I remember very explicitly one of these employees who happened to be back in, um, uh, in, in Arlington um, the entire time I was standing in line trying to get my food, he was talking about, you know, we really should have tea, you know, and I, I think I should talk to Senator Hirono. And so it all, it all kind of came, came, came together. But, uh, it, you know, it was advocacy, as, you, as, as Jeff said, from a senator on an issue that was important to her state, um, but helped us kind of modernize with the times. Um, the, the, the four, while I was at PTO, PTO opened um, four regional offices with the primary uh, a goal of, of hiring new employees, mm -hmm. actually tapping into talent outside of the East Coast, up and down the East Coast a bit, 
um, and, and a few other urban locations. Uh, but, but we had much more need uh, and really wasn't uh, effectively tapping into. So the four offices uh, in, in, in one now one of each other time zones and intended to do that in addition to doing some outreach. So. And if, if the PTO expands again, Hawaii would love to have an outpost there. So. Uh, and, and, um, will they? Are they willing to bring food trucks? Because if they are, then we, we can make food trucks. Okay, there. yes, <laughs> not a good problem. Yeah, it, it's it, you know every every senator, every member of the house, uh, it tends to be at least on their list of questions when they they meet the director of the PTO. Oh, that's great. Are you going to open up an office in my <laughs> district or in my state? We'd really love that. We're a great place. Um, and, and in fact, I don't think it would have been open for some of the advocacy of those that yeah. actually did, yeah. uh, Senator Bennett included. So, all right, so let, let's, Jeff, let's get into some of the issues here. Uh, so, you know, general structure, you talked about Senate Judiciary. There's the House Judiciary Committee, there's also a subcommittee. Senate Judiciary, they have a subcommittee. You're each looking at different issues. Uh, but um, at some point during uh, at least this Congress, uh, I think folks have addressed a lot of those, those same issues. So. Um, let, let's let's take this by order. You know, one of the things you mentioned was uh, patent eligibility, mm -hmm. Section 101 of, of uh, Title 35. Um, and there's been a long conversation, as long as I can remember in my practice, um, uh, about, you know, does there need to be more certainty inserted into Section 101? Um, and only in the last few years has that really uh, bubbled up. Yep. And in part, uh, that's uh, actions by uh, the Supreme Court or opinions that came out of the Supreme Court. Uh, in part, that's probably the push of technology in areas where the patent system was less comfortable uh, and uncertain. So tell us a little bit about uh, how Congress has approached this. And um, we can talk about the likelihood of it moving forward and sure. what would need to happen for it to move forward. Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, lots of issues bubble up uh, to, to the Senate, the House, Congress in general. There's only so much time in the day. You have to pick what issues you're going to really focus on. And in this Congress, um, which started in the beginning of 2019, there was a huge focus on Section 101, patent eligibility. Um, Senators Coons and Tillis started convening these roundtables of people from industry, from uh, the legal community, people, you know, professors at law schools, to really get their arms wrapped around the problem and start kind of brainstorming solutions. Um, so that process went on for months. Um, once they started to get a, a you know, framework for what they thought the issues were, and there were a number of other offices involved as well, including mine in those, those round tables. Um, the, the subcommittee started holding hearings. We had three days of hearings um, on Section 101. Each hearing had three panels of five witnesses each. So we had 45 people come and testify before Congress about Section 101. That is, like, unheard of. Um, in a matter of weeks. Right? Yes, it was yeah. over the span of, like, two weeks. Yes. Um, so people on other committees thought this was crazy, but it shows the importance that, that people in the Senate see on this. You know, out of that um, came, you know, kind of a framework of a reform proposal. Um, nothing has been introduced uh, as a bill just yet. Um, as you can imagine, it's something that's fairly controversial. There are, you know, some people on the small inventor side, on the pharmaceutical side, in med medical diagnostics where there's a big problem with patent eligibility there's a huge push for reform. Where maybe some other um, industries, like some in the big tech space, who are really net defendants in patent litigation, like the system as it is, they see it as an easy, cheap way to strike down patents that are asserted against them. They like to see the status quo. So you have people you know, coming from all sides, some supporting, some opposing, and so far it's just been tough to get kind of that critical mass of support behind any one proposal. And with something that's complicated like this, with powerful interests on each side, if you're gonna really have the senators go out on a limb to introduce a bill, they want to have some chance of making progress. And if, if you're gonna have that, you need some critical mass of strong support of people pushing for that bill. And it's something we're continuing to work at, we wanna find that critical mass, but we just haven't found it yet. So that, that's why you haven't seen a proposal come out there you know, the House has been involved with these discussions as well. They didn't, um, they didn't push as quickly as the Senate side did. Um, I'm still hopeful that you'll see something introduced in this Congress, um, but we're just gonna have to wait and see. Um, yeah, I, I think um, uh, the way you described it is it, it, probably right. It, I think the comparison is, um, you and I talked about yesterday, for major legislation, it certainly takes some time. Yeah. Uh, laying the groundwork, but also building 
uh, significant interest in, frankly, bringing the parties closer together yes. um, uh, so that they're willing to move something forward that, if not consensus, is pretty close, or there's something for everyone. Exactly. You know, there was, I, you know, I'm sure some people might be familiar with, you know, IPO and AIPLA. You know, they put out some proposals on 101, and, you know, if you're on one side of the, the debate, those were great proposals. Yeah. And if you're on the other side of the debate, those are non-starters. Um, and so there were a lot of discussion uh, amongst different offices of, well, what if we, you know, introduce something like that as kind of laying down a marker? And it's like, well, you know, but that doesn't, there's zero chance of that really advancing very far. So what good have you done? You might have just caused people to dig into their positions. You're not going to get anywhere. Right. So that's why this kind of, some people might call it long drawn out, but this important process of having roundtables, having hearings, and this kind of slow march is kind of how you build, and you educate members, you educate offices who might not be familiar with this, you start building consensus, and it's gonna, this is gonna be a multi-Congress multi effort. Um, so I know some people have been asking for the Supreme Court to take action, they've not been interested right now. Um, so people have focused their attention on Congress. Congress is looking at this, but it really does take time to get something like this done. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna add that you, you hope that uh, a lot of that education that you're doing, both with the staff and the members, that both the staff and those members are there yeah. uh, for the long term. But, uh, but you're really creating a record that to bring folks together. That's absolutely right. You know, there's, there's not every. I mean, as I mentioned, I was lucky to find an office that wanted somebody who really knew IP. Not every office necessarily want somebody who really digs into IP. Maybe it's just a small part of an otherwise big portfolio. They may not really understand what's going on here. So drawing them in, helping to, making them prepare for hearings. Yeah. That's how they learn these things. Folks coming in to lobby them on either side help educate them. So this is kind of a long-term educational process. Now you mentioned um, the district court. Uh, there's certainly uh, some activity there. There's lots of activity at the USPTO as well. So we, you know, oftentimes what we talk about is um, this drive for certainty, legal certainty. Um, there's there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, one is is certainly go to con your congressman uh, or your senator, uh, congresswoman or your uh, congressman or, con or senator, um, and advocate for legislative change. Is long arduous process. Um, another way is to be an effective advocate in the courts. Um, and there's a number of, of cases at the lower court level that you could weigh in. Uh, it seems like the federal circuit, at least on this issue, has not been taking. Uh, cases, so uh, they're not going to lend any uh, immediate certainty there. Uh, but uh, the the office has actually taken some activity here as well yep. uh, to at least uh, change uh, examiner guidance mm -hmm. uh, to make that more consistent, and, and hopefully uh, that's bubbling up to a little bit more consistency. They're still limited by uh, by the law. Exactly, and, and that'll be an interesting kind of inflection point, I think, in this whole reform effort. The Patent Office did a great job and put together, you know, new guidance for examiners, and it really is, you know, these thousands of examiners trying to interpret and compare patents to different cases, it is just an impossible task. Like, I don't envy those people at all. So, you know, the director, you know, took, you really went out on a limb to say, well, then we're going to, you know, take a leadership position here. We're going to put out new guidance because I need to do this for my examiners. The question I have, and I, I voiced this to him, I, I probably voiced it to you when you were still there, is the courts don't have to pay any attention to that. You know, there is, in my mind, a decent chance that one of these patents that came through the, the new guidelines bubble up to the federal circuit, and the federal circuit just completely ignores that guidance. I, it's something I have a concern about. And people who are maybe are keeping their powder dry now because they're happy with the guidance and how it's working, well, all of a sudden they're going to have a real a real problem yep. if the courts start ignoring it. So that, like I said, that'll be an interesting inflection point when those cases start bubbling up. If the courts say, you know what, we think what the PTO did makes a lot of sense, we're going to give that some weight and, and try to follow it. Well, maybe that really fi helps to fix the system. But if some district court or the federal circuit says. That, we don't have to pay any attention to that agency action. We're just going to ignore it. Well, then you know we're we're in a problem because um, it just creates this this mess of a system where nobody knows what's patent eligible anymore. As a former clerk, uh, <laughs> did you did you look at uh, federal regulations? Did you look at it well, and in particular examiner guidance? I mean, we we certainly did. Um, you know, it's it's some persuasive authority, but it's certainly not binding. Um, you know, I clerked for a judge who came from the patent I office, was just say as you know, <laughs> and my judge was a solicitor at the patent office. 
um, he gives you know what the patent office does you know attention. I won't say that he gives it binding weight because oftentimes it doesn't carry binding weight. Um, so I'm really interested to see how this plays out when it bubbles up. But certainly he more than others know the the persuasive arguments that are being made. Why why it ended up. And I think he also understands just the practical yep. impacts of what was going on at the PTO right. and, and how difficult it was for them. Right. Okay. So first issue. Um, I'm trying to address uncertainty. For in the licensing context, um, uncertainty goes directly to value. Uh, so certainly some technologies might be in a little better position. But for right now, this is an issue to watch, continue discussion, uh, and, and maybe some change uh, Congress or two down the road. Um, uh, so let's, let's go to the second issue. Kind of, kind of related, um, you said you, you started talking about the Stronger Act. Um, um, I entered this as when uh, Senator Coons had introduced the Stronger Act. Um, I started to uh, get co-sponsors, including Senator Hirono, um, as an as a, almost as an opposition bill mm -hmm. to litigation reform. Uh, but there's a number of other things in there that were uh, uh, pro-competitive. What's the status of the Stronger Act, um, and do you see either that or portions of it moving forward? Sure. So you know, this is the idea of it takes mo many Congresses to get certain things done. You know, my boss was a co-sponsor of the Stronger Act when it was just the Strong Act. That, that shows how far back it goes. Uh, maybe it'll pass when we have the strongest act, I'm not sure. Um, but what we've seen in this Congress is we had a hearing in the, the subcommittee uh, focused on the Stronger Act. That's, that's the first time that has happened, and that's a big step. It shows kind of some of the momentum that's, be, that's being built, the recognition of, you know, that people don't understand how much um, weight they should put behind the patent office granting a patent. Um, and like you said, that goes directly to the value of these patents. My boss, you know, she didn't support the American Vents Act uh, back when that went through. Um, she believes in strong patent rights. She thought this was going to undercut the value of patents and reduce the incentives for people to create. And she feels that that's come true to an extent. So she's really supportive of the Stronger Act. We'd love to see that, you know, get a vote. Um, we'll have to wait and see if that happens. But if not, as you said, there may be opportunities to take pieces of that, whether it be PTAB reform, whether it be um, increasing the, you know, putting a presumption for injunctions, um, maybe attaching that to some other vehicle. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw the Arthrex decision that got decided in the Federal Circuit, um, saying that PTAB judges were unconstitutionally appointed, and the court kind of did their effort of a fix for that. Well, Congress, um, in the House in particular, they had a hearing on that. They're looking at a potential fix for that Arthrex issue. Well, you know, maybe with that, there's some trade-off to, okay, well, you know, some member will say, I'll help you get that through if you'll introduce some of these reforms that I'm looking at. Um, so there's, there are always potential vehicles like that to introduce reforms, and we'll see how it all shakes out. Good. So let's do, can we do one more patent issue before we move on, no, move on to some trademark and cover issues? Um, uh, Drug prices. Mm. Everyone's always concerned about drug prices. Um, there's a balance between innovation mm -hmm. uh, and investing and, and recovering uh, that, that investment. Uh, there's been lots of uh, proposals, uh, some which affect substantive IP rights um, that have been in Congress, um, uh, both, uh, both in the House and the Senate. And the proposals are, 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 are quite different. Um, what's the likelihood of us seeing some uh, legislation addresses drug prices? And then, number one. Number two, what's the likelihood of it addresses or affects substantive IP rights? Because it seems that that's certainly one approach, but not the only approach. Yeah. Um, so there are, as you mentioned, there are a number of proposals out there that um, you know, really run the gamut from just you know, allowing Medicare to, to negotiate drug prices to um, you know, things that are fairly draconian if you're a, a strong patents, if you come from a strong patents perspective where if a drug company doesn't meet the pricing of some foreign country, you're going to make you know issue a compulsory license for for another manufacturer. This is a space where I think there's a decent chance that some legislation will be passed. You have, <coughs> excuse me, the president calling for legislation on drug pricing, and he's introduced some proposals. You have both houses have introduced a variety of proposals, and some of them that have cleared pretty powerful committees. We had a drug pricing bill that cleared the Judiciary Committee, introduced by Senators Blumenthal and Cornyn, um, passed unanimously, if I remember correctly, um, that addresses 
to an extent, these ideas of patent thicketing and product hopping, if, if folks are, bit, are familiar with those, gives the FTC some authority to investigate potential anti-competitive behavior. Another bill came out of the Finance Committee that's co-sponsored by Senator Grassley and Senator Wyden, the chair and ranking of that committee. These are powerful senators who have gotten behind these bills. And when, when you have Republicans, Democrats in, in Congress and the President all calling for reform, there's a decent chance something is going to happen. As far as whether or not, how, what impact that's going to have on substantive patent rights, it, it brings me back to something that Senator Kennedy from Louisiana said. He likes to use these like folksy expressions that I kind of love, but he, he kind of like cuts to the chase. And I think it was in a drug pricing hearing that we had, we had these folks from some of the drug companies talking about how, you know, oh, you can't, you know, undercut our incentive to innovate. We have to be able to recover for, you know, dry holes in our research. And he said, well, look, we're getting to a point where, you know, the American people are, are screaming for change here. People can't afford their insulin. They can't, they're skipping drugs. They're driving to Canada or Mexico to buy drugs. They are so adamant that change is necessary. We in Congress are just going to do something. And maybe you'll, like, you, maybe you'll like it, you probably won't. So you need to get on board and help shape the reform. Because otherwise, we're going to do something that you hate. Um, and I, I hope that was kind of a warning shot to folks in this space of you may be totally against any type of reform. Well, some reform might be coming. So you better help shape that reform to make sure it's something, even if you don't like it, at least you can live with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think there's a decent chance something happens. Hopefully it doesn't break the patent system. <laughs> well, I think it, that goes back to the, the uh, you talked about momentum. Uh, momentum uh, uh, and interest for the public causes Congress to sometimes act. Um, it goes back to the education issue. Mm -hmm. um, something must be done. There's a problem that we have to address. Do they understand the, how the patent system works? Yeah, and uh, it's, and it's, the importance of some of these things. And it's tough to at a level. Yeah, it's tough to explain to somebody why the patent system is so important. Where the other side is saying, can you afford your insulin, or did you skip your insulin this week? What aren't you paying for so that you can pay for your drugs? Right. You know, that that argument you know, is, is so clear and easy on its face that it's tough to balance that with this, you know, kind of wonky incentive discussion of, well, we might not get the next round of drugs because we don't have sufficient, you know, investment in the next generation. Some people, maybe they don't even get that, and others might just say, well, I don't care about the next round of drugs. I can't afford my drugs today. Um, so these are just things you have to balance. Yep, yep. All right, so uh, topic one, 101, we talked about two and three, again, to watch. Mm -hmm. Number three, drug patents, highly visible, so there's a lot of momentum. Uh, we'll see which, uh, which solutions kind of move forward yeah. uh, there. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, trademark issue. Um, as I was leaving PTO, there was a lot of uh, discussion about the integrity of the trademark system. Um, that also goes to kind of the value of the mark in the marketplace. Um, and the ability of the off, not just the office, to maintain uh, the register, but the public to come in and challenge marks that might uh, eat, eat into into their market. Um, that's been at least one of the conversations I think that you've had, and you recently held a hearing on this issue. Yeah, you know, this, the Senate uh, recently held a hearing on kind of the pat uh, their trademark clutter issue on the register. Um, a lot focusing on this influx of trademark applications that are coming over. China, um, which a lot of them just look fraudulent on their face, you know, using the same picture of a good with just different labels photoshopped on as their evidence of use in commerce. Um, it's something that really caught people's attention because it's an easy thing to understand. Um, and also, you know, if you tell somebody that China is manipulating our system, they're, they're ready to go and ready to do something about it. This is a space where the House is actually out in front of us. They, they held a hearing quite some time ago. Um, some folks on the staff there uh, held a series of roundtables. You're going to keep hearing about those you know, roundtables in different spaces. If somebody wants to get something done, they have to get stakeholders on board. So they often do these roundtable processes. Um, so I know there's some reform legislation working its way through the House. Um, you know, something will likely be introduced uh, in the near term that you know, might introduce you know, expungement proceedings or other ex parte re-exam proceedings that allow people to challenge marks um, 
that were never used. Um, you know, part of the requirement of a trademark is that it's used in commerce. If something was never used, that should be something that, um, if somebody raises that accusation, the owner of the mark should pretty easily be able to prove that, well, yes, I did use this in commerce, here's the evidence. So that's something that, that uh, the folks in the House are taking a hard look at. They've engaged some of us on the Senate side that you know, we've been riding their coattails a little bit. Um, so I, I certainly think you'll see a bill introduced in the House, um, and, and we'll see how much momentum that gets. Um, but that's an area that, I, because it's a little easier to understand, I think, than some of the patent issues we've talked about, that there's a better chance of, of getting a vote on that. So, I mean, the trademark issue is clearly one, one of the issues that's also important just anti counterfeit. Yeah. Uh, and having a, 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 a valuable tool you can use to, uh, to. No, absolutely. And, you know, we introduced, my boss is a co sponsor of a, a bill um, in, in the Senate um, that gets at counterfeits a bit. Um, I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's like the Counterfeit Seizure Act that's or it. something like that. Um, that basically allows Customs and Border Protection to seize goods that are infringing a design patent. They've had that authority for trademarks for some time um, and other types of IP, but not design patents. Um, you know, we've heard from a lot of industries, um, like in the, the footwear industry, who say, you know, we get um, manufacturers overseas, mainly Chinese, who are shipping in shoes, sneakers, that clearly infringe our design marks. They ship in the trademarks separately, and they attach the trademark once it clears customs because the, they won't get their the shoes seized, the more expensive product. Who cares if they get an envelope of labels seized because they infringe a trademark? They'll just send another envelope. Eventually, one's going to get through. They could attach it and sell these goods. So we've heard a lot about the impact that that's having on U.S. companies. Um, but not just the thing that really struck me is not just from the financial perspective, but safety. Um, you know, another hearing we had on this issue, there was a gentleman who worked for um, Specialized, um, the bike manufacturer, and he brought with him a counterfeit Specialized bike helmet. And he said, you know, look at it, looks just like our helmet. If you weren't looking closely, you wouldn't know the difference. And then he put the helmet in the well of the Judiciary Committee hearing room, and he had a friend of his stomp on it. And the force that this guy stomped on the helmet is a fraction of what you would get if you were riding a bike in hit a tree. And this this helmet like exploded. I mean piece of it almost hit Senator Blumenthal sitting up on the dais. And it just it hit home of, you know, yes, we certainly care about American companies losing money, but we care more about Americans, you know, potentially losing their lives because they they went on some website, they thought they were getting a bike helmet for a good deal, and in fact got some counterfeit that just doesn't meet the safety requirements you would expect. Um, so I, that's part of the reason you see a big push on counterfeits, including the, the Counterfeit Good Seizure Act that I mentioned. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, had, I hadn't heard about that. It's very spectacular. Uh, the the video is online, yes, on the Judiciary Committee website. I think the hearing was in April of last year. You can find it. It was, it was pretty crazy. <laughs> um, the nice thing about this issue, I mean, this is, I can tell you from both outside the government and then inside the government, it's one of those issues that's been talked about for a long time. Mm -hmm. There is a parallel process for trademarks mm -hmm. uh, to record your uh, trademarks at, at customs. Um, there never has been one for design patents, and I think in, in part that's certainly resor government resources. In part, it's, I think uh, there's a lack of education on what the design patent covers. Yeah. And it's, anything to do with patent is just too difficult to understand. Um, but in this case, it, it does seem like it, it could be a, a, good, a good tool for an additional tool for customs agents to sure. be able to I use. mean, it, you know, we get people who, who don't want to see this pass, and they talk about some of the complicated issues about invalidity with design patents. And there certainly are some tougher questions with design patents than there are with trademarks. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think that those should stand in the way of, of a bill like this. Partic working its way through. Particularly in an environment where, you know, we, we are looking at counterfeits. We're looking for additional ways to do this. Certainly this administration is as well. Yeah. Um, so, all right, so it, this issue, issue number four, uh, you know, maybe it might move forward yeah. um, from a from a licensing perspective. It would be an additional tool. Yeah. To say, you know, as a as a fallback, yeah. to say that this is a this is something that we these, we have alternatives to enforce our rights. That's right. And I think you know, as we say this, I, I you know, I hate to always be fudging things and saying like you might see action on this, you might see action on that. If anybody's been paying attention to the Senate in particular, we just don't spend a lot of time on legislation these days. You know, if you look at the Senate floor calendar for any week, you know. You don't see legislation being voted on. You see 
judges being confirmed, you know, um, political appointees in the administration being confirmed. So if you want to get something passed, you kind of have two chances. One is it's big enough and has enough attention like criminal justice reform where you can, you can convince leadership that it deserves floor time, right? It takes time to get things, a piece of legislation through the Senate on the floor and it blocks everything else. The other is it's either so small or has such um, resounding support that no senator will object to it. You can do anything in the US Senate if you have unanimous consent to do so. But if one senator objects, it means you have to follow the rules. Um, so as I said, you don't see much floor time in the Senate on legislation, but every day some legislation passes. But it passes by unanimous consent. It's small, it's narrow, it's non-controversial. So some of these, these bills that we've talked about might meet that, you know? Or something like my boss is the um, co-sponsor of something called the CASE Act, which creates a small claims um, court within the Copyright Office. There's a chance something like that might pass by unanimous consent and works its way through. Um, but if you get to some of these bigger issues that have opposition on both sides, um, some of these drug pricing bills, or um, you know, if 101 reform, you're never going to get that through on unanimous consent because you have people legitimately on the other side of the issue, and they just won't let it move that quickly. Yeah, yeah the Case Act's an interesting uh, uh, example. I mean, I, I assume there, it, there in the copyright world, there, there's there's certainly industry associations mm -hmm. that that can claim they represent most of them. If you get them in a good place uh, to help move forward. Um, and that's the thing, I mean, it's, it's a bill, you know, you hear, we've heard from a lot of small creators, you know, um, songwriters, authors, photographers, who say, you know, bringing a copyright claim in federal district court costs like $300,000, you know, I'm talking about such a smaller amount of damages, I can never get an attorney to represent me in those cases. So, you know, this bill has, like I said, it's a small claims copyright court. You're not going to find, you know, a lot of members who are against small creators, right? And if there are enough carve-outs in the bill to make sure that it's not going to lead to some abuse, or it's not going to pull in, you know, some big corporation in a way that nobody anticipated, that might be something that you can get through without objection, and we'll see if we can do that. I want to hit one uh, point you mentioned earlier, and then we'll get to some questions, because uh, before we run out of time. Um, talk about roundtables. Um, uh, in the one-on-one context and also in the trademark context. Um, certainly, uh, uh, committees have hearings and they invite uh, companies or practitioners to come speak, so there's a formal opportunity there. This is a less formal opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as a, as a staffer or as a member, um, what's, uh, what's helpful for you as you're thinking about this discussion, as you're trying to move things forward, uh, in terms of hearing input, either in formal or informal way? Sure. You know, I, I've found, you know, these roundtable sessions that I've gone to to be the most effective place to really share ideas. You know, frequently, you know, members or even witnesses who are at hearings, you know, look, you've got the camera on you, you know, the spotlights are on, you just might be a little cautious in what you're saying. You're trying to, if you're a trade association, you're trying to toe that company line, not necessarily give an inch on things. We're in these, these round tables, people complain that they're behind closed doors and we don't know what's going on. But that's where you can really get people to be honest and say, look, here's why I can't support that idea, but I'd be willing to come this fall. Or, you know, I still won't like it, but if you only do this, I won't oppose it, you know? So you can really flesh people out to figure out what is the, tr you know, where is the true opposition? What is driving that opposition? And can you find a compromise um, to, to meet people halfway. Um, and so I think, you know, while there are a lot of people who push back on those type of things, I just think they're critical if you really want to get anything done. Yeah. Otherwise, you're meeting with one office at a time. It's tough to, you know, coordinate messages and get people to talk back and forth. If you can get folks all in a room to hash these out, it's just such an easier process. Folks aren't posturing. Yeah, they're, that's they're, right. They're actually having a real conversation. Yeah. Well, the other thing that yeah, you and I talked about this yesterday is, is uh, either as a staff or as a member, having actual examples in your head mm -hmm. uh, as you see the next 10 people that come in your door, uh, that you can say, okay, well, I understand it over here, but there is this company that said this. Yeah. And this is how what they believe and what, what they're interested in. It really kind of brings the issue it to does. Life. And it's, helps them understand. It. And, and these things, maybe there are some offices who will show up at a round table, not really to actively participate, but they just want to learn. 
You know, I had somebody ask me not long ago about the um, the Google Oracle case at the Supreme Court, yeah. and yeah. you know, do you see the Senate, you know, or Congress trying to take action? And I said, well, first you have to educate offices on what is going on. You know, they don't under you know most offices don't have somebody who understands you know APIs and you know what exactly is being copied, what isn't being copied. It takes effort to educate people on these issues. And, and these roundtables where you can people can ask dumb questions and say stupid things and not feel embarrassed because it's up on the Judiciary Committee website, you know, just a great place. Um, it, it, and you can do uh, more efficiently than just visiting individual offices yes. and walk through. Excellent. Um, well, I feel like, Jeff, really some of the audience were eating into billable hours. So, um, I don't, don't miss those days. There's so many more things we could talk about. You, you talked about the, the committees looking at DMC, uh, doing copyright oversight. I know uh, the copyright office is, is, will soon be looking for, is looking for actually a new uh, register of copyrights. Uh, there's antitrust issues, a lot, lots of things. Um, but why don't we go to see if there's any questions in the room, um, or I don't know if we can get some questions from folks listening online. Uh, so before we close out, uh, we actually have a little bit more interactive. Sure. So. Absolutely. I have a question. Erica. <laughs> and this is actually for both of you with your backgrounds. Um, on the 101 issue, I think um, you did a great job of summarizing it and uh, explaining why it, what is going on. My question is, you mentioned some of the bar associations, right? We've got the independent benefit. Where, based on your experience, based on what you read, where it is, where is the best source for that? Who, I mean, we need that sort of critical mass builder. Who is that? Or is that an organization? I mean, each association has its kind of stakes out there. And I just, I'm, you know, who sure. is, how, how do we, what, what would your ideas be for who to write, uh, who is best situated, I guess, to build that consensus over time, even if it is a long term? You know, is it a crew of professors? I, I don't know. What, what is it? You know, and, uh, Dana, I'm interested here. What you have to say? I, I mean, I think some of the associations are a great place to start. You know, obviously with the the IPO and the AIPLA, you know, having put out their proposals, obviously this is something their members really care about, and you know, they can bring those folks together and say, okay, we put forth, you know, what we really want, but it's clear that that we're not going to be able to get the support to pass something like that. So let's let's talk about what we can live with. You know, we heard there was a, a, not a formal bill introduced, but kind of draft legislation that was passed around that touched on some other areas of the Patent Act, you know, some, some changes to 112, some changes to some other things. And we've got a lot of uh, blowback uh, from those ideas. Some from people who I don't think quite understood what was going on, but some people had some real concerns. And if, if those groups can, can talk to their members and see all right, well, if we can't live with that, we see where staff is going, you know, what, what might we be able to live with is a great thing. I also know just some of the kind of the, you know, for lack of a better term, but some of the, the graybeards in the space, you know, Judge Michelle has taken a real leadership role in trying to bring people together. Former Director Kapos has been doing some work to bring people together. Those folks who recognize there's a real problem, who carry weight with what they say, you know, if they could bring some players together, groups, Kind of the, some of the big companies, and you know, hash out a framework for what they they can live with, and that would help them. Um, I think would be a great place to start. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I think it's um, it, it's about not just having the right solution, but doing it at the right time. Um, and I've been saying for some time that um, there's too much space between the two sides. We didn't talk a lot about this, but you know, it, it takes legislation a long time to get passed. In part because you have to build consensus, you have to bring the parties together. It took five Congresses for the American Events Act uh, to actually pass uh, the Congress. In that time, the legislation changed significantly. Uh, but at the end, there was a package of, of things that, that, that folks could, could support. Um, I think the lessons from the AIA were that um, you know, IP doesn't fall down partisan lines. It's not necessarily a Republican issue, not a Democratic issue. It certainly falls down the technology lines. Uh, different players in the space use the patent system differently depending on the technology they're developing, depending on the speed at which the technology develops, depending on how many separable patentable, patentable uh, uh, technologies are in a particular product. Um, you know, there's lots of things that affect the way that they look at the patent system. That creates dividing lines. And right now what we're seeing is uh, traditional IP holders, uh, manufacturing, certainly pharmaceutical bio, 
Um, although they, they, there's some variation within there too, uh, have very different views from the more high tech side. Um, but until you find a way to get the parties together, um, you're, you're not gonna push towards legis legislation, which is why I, I, I tend to be a little bit negative that it'll happen tomorrow. It's almost um, like we need that voice to say, we're gonna do something. It's got yeah. to a critical crisis point, the Supreme Court throwing yep. up its hand, and there's real impacts. Yep. We're doing something. Yep. Um, something you know, everybody you do, yeah. And it, it, right, it could be something. Um, the Supreme Court's a good good trigger uh, if they took a case. Um, but I think I think in the meantime, you do need to have folks like it, uh, uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, uh, Dave Kapos and, and Judge Michelle, very publicly, have kind of um, uh, pulled people together who want to see a solution to talk about what that solution will look like. And in fact, they're even you know uh, to some extent they probably are talking about what they could live with, what they couldn't live with. Uh, but they're having a conversation about the right solution that works for them. The other side's not at the table. So at some point, what you see is people starting to negotiate against themselves. I do think that's an important conversation for them to continue to have, so you may create a base. But it does mean that it's still a long road to get there. Um, there, there. There may need to be a trigger. There may need to just be more education. Now, the, the, the one... Um, uh, the, the one aspect about right now is you have real leadership in the, the Senate and the House, uh, but particularly the Senate, Tillis and Coons, that, that would love to see something happen here. Um, they just aren't bringing the parties together yet. That may not always be the case. Yeah. Um, so there's some fear that in a, in a future Congress, you're going to have a, a, a taller mountain to climb to make this case. Uh, again, all the more important to create a public record, 45 witnesses over two or three weeks, um, to have at least uh, the practitioners who are working in this space uh, having an active conversation about what the proposal would be so when we have an opportunity to move forward. Um, and then, and then frankly, we, we talked a little bit about it before, there's, there's three areas, right? You keep pushing uh, to try to make the good arguments in amicus briefs or, or, uh, or in opinions coming out from the courts. You uh, continue to watch the implementation of the PTO. In fact, you point out the things that the PTO can't do. Um, and then that all informs the legislative conversation and hopefully Hopefully that gets us to a place where, where you can. So I, I think that work is still critical um, with some of the other things we mentioned in terms of people saying, here are the real problems. Um, it's gonna be what hopefully will bring the parties closer together. Yeah. So. Uh, other questions from folks? Where are we on time? I think we're about five minutes over from people. Um, so I, I, got a, I got a thumbs up on good, <laughs> uh, but I think a thumbs, let's get out of here and help let people get back to their billable hours and celebrate Mardi Gras. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I think Stephen will take us out. Sure. Do you have the microphone? Uh, I do, yeah. I think it's on. Is it on? Is it on now? Well, here. It's not on. There you go. For the benefit of everybody on the web, I just want to say thanks for joining. Um, thanks to everybody in the room. Uh, this is a very thoughtful discussion. Uh, Jeff, Lina, thank you very much for being here today. We really Sorry. appreciate your candid comments and your overview of what's happening on Capitol Hill. Absolutely. Thanks all. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.